Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning stories, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their cores very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. My guest this week is Brian Weiner. Brian is co-founder of Audit Capital and Partners and managing partner of Audit Family Wealth Advisors, where he leads the firm's Global Family Offices Services Program, Outsourced Chief Investment Officer Programs, and Next Generation Educational Programs. So the subject for today's episode is one we've gotten a ton of requests for in the past, Michael Jackson. I'm not sure there's anyone who doesn't know who Michael Jackson is, but just in case, Michael Jackson was an American singer, songwriter, and dancer, which dubbed the king of pop and is regarded as one of the most significant cultural figures of the 20th century. His sound and style have influenced artists of various genres, and his contributions to music, dance, and fashion, along with his publicized personal life, made him a global figure in pop culture for over four decades. Oh, and he's the most awarded artist in the history of popular music, so there's that. Starting in the late 1980s, Jackson became a figure of controversy and speculation due to his changing appearance, relationships, bizarre behavior, and lifestyle. In 1993, he was accused of sexually abusing the child of a family friend. The lawsuit was settled out of court and Jackson wasn't indicted. In 2005, he was tried and acquitted of further child sex abuse allegations and several other charges. Four years later, while preparing for a series of comeback concerts called This Is It, Jackson died from an overdose of Provofol, administered by his personal physician, Conrad Murray. In 2017, the documentary Leaving Netherland detailed posthumous allegations of child sexual abuse by Jackson and is, to be generous, a very uncomfortable watch. Jackson's estate was largely handled via poor over trusts that split the bulk of his remaining net worth among his children, mother, and various charities. That said, he left nearly $500 million in debt behind as well, a great deal of which was due to the IRS assigning an astronomical $730 million value to his estate, largely due to the giant likeness it assigned his name and his name, value it assigned his name and likeness of $434 million. And keep in mind, this is in spite of a lifetime of child abuse and pedophilia allegations. God only knows how high this number would have been had Jackson's image been squeaky clean. It's a great credit to his executors that they've managed to sort of wriggle out from under this crushing debt and turn the Jackson's estate into a massively pop profitable enterprise. Through a combination of selling some of Jackson's valuable assets, such as the rights to the Beatles back catalog, which he owned, capitalizing on renewed interest in Jackson after his death by renegotiating a large record deal with Sony and releasing three posthumous albums, as well as leveraging his image to, for example, create a pair of successful Cirque du Soleil shows. The estate has earned some $2 billion since Jackson's death. Asset protection is an important aspect of any estate plan, and it's not uncommon for even exceptionally wealthy and complex estates to also have to reckon with a certain amount of debt along with the expected tax burdens. One technique that can be useful in mitigating some of these risks is the use of multiple entities. Brian, before we get into the advantages and pursuant complexities that can arise from employing this technique, do you mind explaining for our listeners what exactly we mean when we say entity? Sure. Normally, what we refer to as entities are wills, trusts, foundations, and in some cases, LLCs and corporations. So what's the sort of client profile, what you would look at for you know, trying to incorporate sort of multiple entities? Is it for everyone or is it only for certain clients? Well, there usually is no one size fits all. Um, however, in various states where there are laws for something called probate, uh, everyone should at least have a will and a living trust, uh, particularly in the state of California, where again, we do have probate. 
And if we want to avoid probate, which is the process by which when someone passes away, uh, the state uh, would come in and, as you were noted earlier, uh, value the estate uh, and make determinations for tax purposes uh, on how to handle someone's assets and overall uh, estate value and, and, and management. Uh, and, and if you don't have a living trust in place to address issues uh, relating to the ownership of assets, uh, then the state will take over uh, and your new partner is the government. Uh, and, and, and that's something that uh, most people uh, would not want to have uh, become the case. Uh, it delays decision making, it delays the ability to transfer assets to the next generation. Uh, or to various loved ones. So having these entities in place, and again, the basics of a will and living trust is super important for, for practically everyone. Mm -hmm. I know um, just for our, reader, for our listeners, you're using the term living trust and will somewhat interchangeably. I know you're in California, and so in California, living trusts have largely replaced wills as I understand it, but they kind of serve the same purpose for the most part? Correct, a living trust, well, a will is incorporated inside the living trust. And in California, you, you, you need to have uh, a living trust to avoid probate. A will alone uh, will not do it. So we're looking to set the estate up. So where do we start? We start with this, the, the will of the living trust? Correct. That's the foundation is you start with the basics of a living trust. And then with the help of advisors, a trust and estate attorney, CPA and, and, and others, uh, you build on the foundation from there. Uh, depending upon uh, the goals and desires of the estate uh, that you would have for your estate. And that's really where complexity can come in, uh, depending upon uh, what you are looking to transition and transfer uh, upon your death, or even during life. Uh, because let's not forget, uh, there's gift tax, and gift tax occurs when someone's alive. Uh, and that tax uh, can be quite extensive. And uh, most of my time this month uh, and last has been set uh, dealing with people using up their lifetime gift uh, exemption amounts, uh, possible uh, concern uh, uh, that the Democrats would take over the, the House and the Senate and, and remove uh, the exemption limits, which are quite high right now. So the, the wealthy are transferring uh, and using up their lifetime exemption and the process uh, as much of their assets to the next generation as they possibly can, particularly low uh, basis investments in companies and in, in stock and in real estate uh, so that they don't have to worry about that as part of their overall estate plan later on. That's interesting. Let's, let's talk about this gift tax exemption for a minute because on this podcast, we largely talk about it in terms of, of the estate tax exemption, they're, they're the same thing, but we don't often uh, get into sort of the gift tax element of it. So do you mind expanding on sort of the usefulness, of, of, uh, the relevance, I guess, of gift tax in this area and sort of the, the usefulness of this exemption? Sure. Uh, well, currently it's, it's a little over 11 million per person. If it is reduced, or even if you go above that, uh, it's at a 50% uh, level uh, that, there, that there's a tax such that you know, people are incentivized uh, to use up their lifetime exemption if they believe that the exemption limits are going to decrease uh, and put them in uh, various other vehicles, whether that's more sophisticated trusts or entities and so forth. Uh, it's super important that uh, for the majority of people who are not uber wealthy, as you put it, that they, that they can gift various assets, uh, cars, jewelry, uh, homes even, uh, to their loved ones. Uh, and it doesn't have to be family. It could be uh, a non-family member without the fear of that person uh, having to pay uh, a huge uh, tax uh, upon such a gift. So the gift tax is what a lot of people uh, you and I and, and others are most concerned with um, during our life uh, as it relates to uh, death. And then you're, like you said, dealing with a state tax, uh, that, that's a different animal. Uh, that's obviously when, 
when you're gone, uh, that's going to impact your, your, your loved ones in a very different way, uh, such that you want to make sure that you have other uh, instruments in place, whether that's uh, LLCs and trusts or foundations or uh, a litany of tools that are in the toolbox to help uh, people to successfully transition uh, assets to the next generation. And that planning, David, um, it happens it, it should uh, during someone's life when they're healthy, when they have time to really be thoughtful about it. And whether it's the Jackson estate or, or other estates, the more runway that you give yourself to be thoughtful uh, about your giving of your estate to the next generation or to loved ones, friends, and, and or the community at large, uh, the more, I would say, success that you could have managing the estate for success. What do you mean when you say managing the estate for success? What I mean is, is that if your goals and objectives are to help the community, then setting up uh, a foundation may or may not be the right approach. You may, there, there's other options. By way of example, you can set up uh, and work with the community foundations and set up a donor advised fund, which has much less cost and administrative uh, over, oversight because that's being outsourced to a community foundation uh, or another entity to assist you. And, and generally that, that can lead to more dollars going to the various causes. Uh, it also uh, keeps uh, the, if you don't have an estate, if you don't have, in other words, siblings and children uh, or others that you just frankly don't trust to, to administer the foundation on your behalf, having organizations like the California Community Foundation or the Jewish Community Foundation or, or some other organization that's set up to, to administer it, uh, assist, that, that can give you peace of mind that at least your, uh, your desires to help the community are going to be fulfilled without the risk of, I'm setting up a foundation for, you know, my kids will administer it, but wait a minute, what if my kids aren't educated enough or Frankly, they don't have the charitable intent that I have, uh, and that happens. Uh, there are various instances uh, where that has been the case, uh, and I've, I've spoken to some very well-known people who now have to spend most of their professional time uh, working on behalf of a very large family foundation, uh, and that consumes their life. And in some cases, they may want to have been a doctor or some other professional, but now they're uh, you know, spending most, if not all of their time, fulfilling the needs and desires of their grandparents and parents, administering a large foundation versus uh, having, having that uh, outsourced to other organizations to help them with. Yeah, and for listeners, that may sound sort of awful, right? Where it's like, who's this person complaining about being in charge of a charity and giving to people and being unfulfilled by giving? It's not that they're unfulfilled by giving. This is a pretty common fact pattern um, amongst sort of the ultra high net worth is that they just they may still have the same charitable values. Their parents may have successfully passed on their charitable values to this to this child, but maybe they just have different charitable interests. So, right. you know, maybe well, the parents have been heavily invested in, I don't know, the state of Israel and they really want to support the state of Israel. But, you know, the kid cares about the climate and animal rights and he's super passionate about that and highly charitable, but doesn't care about Israel and finds himself running a massive charitable foundation for the state of, you know what I mean? Well, exactly. So that's, how, that's how you end up in these situations where it's not necessarily this ungrateful, unchar uncharitably inclined kid. A lot more often, it's sort of like charitably inclined in a different direction. Correct. And now they're stuck in this life that their parents kind of left on them. Correct. As well as another really good example of what you're saying is uh, the millennial generation and Gen Zers are much more inclined and interested in, in helping the cause directly. Uh, in terms of how they're donating their dollars, they, they want to see the money uh, having a direct impact on the environment, the climate, the homeless and hunger issues. Uh, so their methodology of giving uh, is, is different than what we've seen historically. Uh, and that isn't a bad thing at all. Uh, and we don't want to stifle that, that approach. We want to uh, allow for growth and sometimes foundations uh, don't allow us to best do that. Or, or even trusts and estates. Uh, something we haven't talked about, David, is 
uh, one of the challenges of, of the, whether it's the ultra high net worth or not, is it's an opportunity for some controlling individuals uh, during their lives to, to what I say and call rule from the grave. <laughs> In other words, uh, I, I was very controlling over my money while I was alive, and I'm going to be very controlling with it when I'm when I'm gone. Um, and that's something that happens uh, far too often. And sometimes you get the opposite, where there's not enough thought at all, and they and, and this is what happened, I think, in the Jackson estate and others is often estates are set up based on um, age. Uh, so when someone reaches the age of 21 uh, or 30, 35, 40, 45 is when assets start to distribute from an estate um, that is driven by someone graduating college, someone being old enough to start a family and have children versus a different approach, which may be perhaps more thoughtful, um, driven by milestones. Uh, driven by achievement uh, and and need, and that requires different thought. That in 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 often involves an engaged conversation with the trust and estate attorney, uh, and and the family itself, and that's where things break down. Uh, where there's not that forum and that opportunity to really be thoughtful, uh, as as families and certainly those that have enormous wealth. Uh, should should be engaging in. And this is one of those areas where sort of a, to break out a, a, a current buzzword where sort of intentionality in the planning um, can really be important and sort of, you know, it's not just thinking about it like, okay, give it to them at 21 and 35. It's, it's asking that next question of, okay, but why? And sort of sometimes that one question, taking that one step further, now launches into a much larger conversation that, that wouldn't have necessarily been had, it may result in, in a much more, um, you know, fulsome and, and better estate plan for the family. A hundred percent. And and there are communities in, you know, wealthy areas like Newport Beach, where, uh, you know, a generation of kids are sitting playing Sony PlayStation right now. Um, and I'm not exaggerating. They are ill prepared to receive the responsibility associated with the wealth and the assets that the estate is about to bestow upon them. And, and that creates not only issues for the family, but also lost opportunity for the community. Because as we're experiencing uh, this enormous transfer of wealth that everyone uh, keeps reading about and listening about over the next 10 years, um, wow, if, if that generation is ill-prepared and or unwilling to give in the same way that their parents may have or their grandparents, the legacy of the family is certainly tarnished or lost, uh, but also the community loses out as well. And if you look, uh, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, uh, that, that is a huge concern for uh, uh, religious organizations, for non-religious organizations and charities and philanthropies uh, worldwide, is how to capture the millennial generation, uh, the Gen Zers, and their attention uh, in a way that uh, ensures that giving uh, continues, if not increases, based on the fact that we're talking about even more wealth than uh, we were dealing with 20, 30 years ago by mere fact that the estate has grown exponentially. Yeah, and this is an interesting problem because as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, this millennial generation that we're having this sort of debate about is also, you know, by those statistics, seemingly much more charitably inclined than their parents just naturally, just kind of in a different way more. And I'm going to go help myself as opposed to I'm going to give the money. But that doesn't mean that they're still not going to end up with the money and that they should still give it, even though that's not necessarily how they're inclined to help. Or they rebel, which is, hey, you know what, I want to do things differently. My parents or grandparents uh, didn't set things up in a way that I think is reasonable and fair. So I'm just going to withdraw uh, into my own world and, and in my own head. And, and that's what's happening far too often with certain, within certain communities uh, of ultra high net worth. Um, and or you get the opposite where there are people that are saying, you know what, there is the family foundation and but I'm going to start my own 
and do things uh, differently uh, and more directly to the causes that I believe need to be uh, supported. The challenge there, David, is that they don't necessarily have the tools or the resources to know where to turn uh, to, to impact the community. And so either they give up at that point if they don't ask professional guidance and support or their parents say to them, well, if you wanna do something different than the family, uh, best of luck to you. And they don't, uh, they don't support them in that endeavor. Um, and that does happen. So it, it really, again, goes back to proper planning at the onset that is flexible enough to allow for different thoughts and processes and abilities for the next generation to, to be philanthropic, uh, to be giving, uh, and to uh, be heard and understood. Yeah, and it's so interesting because the answers to so many of these questions are like just right there, mm -hmm. you know, but it's just so hard to get people to, you know, because of the personal element of things and, and you're involving families and personalities to get them to actually realize the answer to your question of doing it correctly is literally sitting next to you, right? Like the example you gave of the kid who has, you know, there's a grand foundation, but he wants to start his own, but doesn't know how. It's like, well, you have an in with a grand foundation that can tell you exactly how to do this, if only you know, A, they've reached, maybe they've failed to reach out to you to, to make you realize that they're there as a resource, even if you don't want to be involved directly in that foundation, or you're, you decided to be stubborn and you just want to show them. And then that's something else that needs to be sort of overcome. But like, that doesn't mean that the answer isn't sitting right next to you a lot of the time. Indeed. And, and there are banks and wealth management uh, and trust companies that, that try to e educate the next generation. Uh, I've spent a considerable amount of my professional career and non-professional working with others and helping to educate and, and build what we call resiliency uh, to be able to work uh, and, and execute on your individual goals uh, within the family ethos. Uh, and environment and culture, creating individuality in your own voice uh, when you're dealing with often very controlling first generation wealth creators is possible. The, the challenge sometimes, again, is having the right foundation set up to begin with. And while it may start with the living trust and, or, or will and, and the basics, it's, it has to be built upon and, and, and discuss continuously. Most of the time, we are all guilty of this. We, we have our trust document. We don't look at it. And once it's signed, once it's done, we don't look at it until there's a reason to look at it. But as most trust and estate attorneys and CPAs and others who are really thoughtful on this topic will say, not only are the laws changing yearly uh, and state by state, but, but the lives of all of us, We're, people are getting born, people are graduating, people are, are, being, uh, are, are getting degrees and educated and starting their own families. And if we don't evolve our trust documents and our estate plan along the way, uh, we're gonna lose out on these, uh, these important uh, opportunities. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank Brian Weiner for being just a fantastic guest and really helping us unpack some complex and complicated issues. Thanks so much, Brian. My pleasure. And for all our listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.